Well, hello everybody. It's Tuesday and it's comedy night. Oh yes, you need to laugh a lot this evening. Lots of belly laughing. It's good for the soul. It's good for your mental health and all of those other things as well. I really am not a mental health expert, so, you know, but laughing is good for you, of course. Everybody knows that laughing is good for you. It releases endorphins in your brain, which make you feel good about yourself. Absolutely. So lots of laughing to be done tonight. Please put yourself in the right frame of mind. Don't think about the day's stresses. Sit back, relax, open your mind to the possibility of humour. What am I garbling on about? I hear you asking. I don't know. I surprise myself sometimes with how much rubbish I can come out with. But it comes out so easily. Anyway, tonight it is adventure with our with an early episode of Hancock's Half Hour. Uh, and this one, it's all about the boys uh, as the boys enter the Monte Carlo Rally. I've been to Monte Carlo. It was very, very good. I went many, many years ago and I went with um, work on an award ceremony. And whilst I was there, they were actually setting up for the Monaco Grand Prix. No, I'm talking about Monaco, Monte Carlo. Same place? Hang on. Yes, of course it is. What am I talking about? Monte Carlo and Monaco are on the same place. I confused myself. I told you I could come out with a load of garbage. Anyway, so while I was there, they were setting up the Monaco Grand Prix and diverting all the traffic and putting all the barriers up, etc., etc. And apparently, Monaco is a motorbike-free zone. You're not allowed to ride motorbikes in Monaco. But once a year, they allow um, motorbike groups to come through and do the Monaco circuit on their bikes. And I got to ride on the back of a bike of a hell's angel, can you believe it? The Monaco Grand Prix racetrack. Yes, it was very good, albeit a little bit nerve wracking because I could not speak French and I did not know this hell's angel and he looked a little bit intimidating, I won't lie. But it was very, very good and it was a lot of fun and definitely a story to tell afterwards. <laughs> anyway, I digress. I had no idea where I was going next. Hancock's Half Hour, all about the boys as they enter Monte Carlo Rally. What could possibly go wrong? The BBC presents Tony Hancock with Moira Lister, Bill Kerr and Sidney James in... Hancock's Half Hour. This week, the whole of Europe is tense with excitement following the course of that exhausting and nerve-wracking endurance test, the Monte Carlo Rally. And this year, we British can feel fairly confident because the cream of our steely nerve racing drivers are driving some pretty fine new machines. So let us take you back to Monday's memorable start from Glasgow. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Brown Johnston reporting from Glasgow starting point for British competitors in this year's edition of the most grueling test for man and machine in the motoring calendar, the famous Monte Carlo Rally. It really is a wonderful sight. Almost every car manufacturer in Britain has entered his latest model, driven by some of the finest drivers in the world. Over there I can see Ken Wharton in his Daimler, yes, and there's Raymond Baxter in his hotted up Ford Zephyr, and Reg Parnell driving one of the Aston Martin DB2s, all tensed up waiting for the signal to start. Now, wait a second. Apparently there's one competitor still to arrive. It's number 101, Britain's top racing driver, Captain Anthony Wheels Hancock. He was, of course, the sensational winner of last year's Grand Prix de Grimsby for foot-operated soapbox. <laughs> Captain Hancock, in his privately entered Sid James special, was last seen a few miles south of Glasgow, so we should see him coming tearing up the starting line any minute now. Now push, push, harder. Get your shoulder behind it, Mora. Dig your heels in. There's a good girl. Push in. Come on, Bill. Get your back in. What's the matter with you? What a car this is. We've had to push it halfway from London. Well, I'd expect to have to push a car occasionally. Yeah, but not downhill. <laughs> I'll stop moaning and push. If we don't hurry up, they'll start without us. Oh, Tony, why don't we give up? We'll never get there. Give up. Wheels, Hancock. Give up. Never. For the last ten Monte Carlo rallies, me and me car have been on that starting line. And stayed there. And stayed there. <laughs> Jolly good. No, Tony, please. Let's rest for a minute. 
I can't push this thing any further. Oh, oh, all right then. Honestly, I don't know what's wrong with the young girls of today. Ask them to push a car for a few miles and they're finished. I... <laughs> a few miles? We left London with 12 gallons of petrol and we've still got 11 and a half. Well, we've used half a gallon, have we? Yeah, and that evaporated. <laughs> Don't blame me. It's Sid's car, not mine. I'm just driving it, that's all. I don't understand it, Sid. What made you enter a car like this in the first place? I'll tell you. The winner of the Monte Carlo rally gets 1,200,000 francs, see? Oh, well, uh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. 1,200,000 francs, 25 acres to the yen, four yen, four <laughs> rupees. Two rupees, one sou. Sous are better than Anna's. 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 That, that reminds me, I haven't heard from Elsie lately. <laughs> See you down the rink, I expect. Never mind. Let's see. Fifteen marks, one centime. Centimes into guilders, a couple of fennix. Makes hey, me... Tom, look, I... Huh? There's just uh, one more little detail to work out. What? How much is one million two hundred thousand francs worth? <laughs> I don't know, but it's a lot of rhino, and I'm going to win it. Listen, this heap wouldn't win the rally if we started in Monte Carlo. Don't be so sure, Billy boy. What happens when all the cars reach Dover? They go on board the ferry to get to France. Exactly. And Uncle Charlie would never let me down. Who's Uncle Charlie? He drives the ferry. <laughs> I hope they all enjoy it. What? The winter cruise to Iceland. <laughs> That's the dirtiest trick I've ever heard of. Yes, I'm rather proud of it myself. Well, we better get a move on or we're not going to get there for the start. Right. Which way do we go? I don't know. Ask that lady there. Oh, wait. Excuse me, madam. What can I do for you? <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. The clothes are very confusing up here. Though. <laughs> Do you, uh, do you know the way to Glasgow? I, I do. Thanks very much. Good day. <laughs> uh, come back. <laughs> yes, jolly good. Thank you. Very helpful. And look, we, look, we're English, see? Oh, you poor wee lad. What a terrible thing to happen to a man. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, well we're, we're lost, you Forsaken see. Forsaken is more the word. <laughs> look, I want to get to Glasgow. Which is the quickest way? Well, let me see now. Glasgow. I've never been there since I was a wee laddie. I'm afraid I might have forgotten how to get there. I've got a terrible, terrible memory. Aye. I'm always forgetting things. Ooh. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm trying. No, it's no good. I'll have to remember the new. I'll have to have something to jog my memory. Uh, turn right to the crossroads, carry on for half a mile. First left, first left again over the level crossing, uh -huh. and then you... Then, then you, then ooh, you uh, it's, it's, ooh. Still, you're losing it again. Uh, ah, yeah, it's gone. Oh, ah, that's it. Carry on for two miles, left of the signpost, past the telephone box, over the railway bridge, and then it... It's then going it's, again, isn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, oh, yes, uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, well, ah, first right, first right again, straight past Angus McPherson's distillery, past Ian McIntosh's distillery, past Duncan McPhee's distillery, past Sandy McTavish's distillery, past Andrew McDuff's distillery, past... Is this the, the, is this the, the quickest way? Yes. No, but it's some of the finest scenery in Scotland. <laughs> right, no. Thank you very much. I think we'll be all right now. Hoots. <laughs> we'll be a while. Goodbye. Lang may your lumreek or whatever that is. <laughs> I love porridge in the springtime. <laughs> Brian Johnston here again, and I really must apologise for the delay in starting this Monte Carlo rally of 1955. But we're still waiting for competitor number 101, Captain Wheels Hancock, to arrive at the start. He's three hours overdue now, and... Oh, wait, wait a minute. I do believe... Yes, yes, here he comes at last. I, I can just see an empty car coming round the corner, closely followed by Hancock and his three assistants. <laughs> well, as you get underway now, as Hancock gets his car into position, yes, it's there, and he's just going over for a word with the official start. Morning. I, I'm sorry we're late. To, where do you want me to put my car? Ah, yes, well, I'm afraid I must, Miss Abbastay. The London to Brighton was run several weeks ago. <laughs> oh, highly amusing that was, yes. <laughs> Listen, this car is entered for the Monte Carlo rally. You've got me entry there. Uh, let me see. Uh, what name? Hancock. H-A-N-C-H-O-C-K. <laughs> the, uh... 
the H is optional. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Hancock. Ah, yes. Captain Wheels Hancock. That's me. Born in 1896. That's the date of the car. <laughs> Sorry, yes, of course. I have the details here. An 1896 modified AJY special. AJY. Assembled from the junkyards. <laughs> I see. What rating is she? Oh, six cylinders, overhead valve engine, twin carburetors, straight through exhaust, special compression air supercharged with a capacity of 3,000 cubic centimeters, developing 160 brake horsepower. That's a special accessory of our own design, which I must say really gets her going. Oh, what's that? A tow rope. <laughs> Well, now then, now then, just a few customs formalities. What equipment will you be taking with you? Uh, me co-driver, Mr. Bill Spanners Kerr. Radio, fog lights, spare tires, and me heater. I don't see any heater. Maura, stand up for the gentleman. <laughs> Well, of course, the owner of the car, Mr. Sporting Sidney James, will also be travelling with us, a most valuable member of my crew. What does he do? He's in charge of the tin tacks and the broken glass. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, here's your timetable. Now, you have to be in Dover by tonight. Do the trolley buses run all the way? <laughs> trolley buses? Of course not. Oh. Sid, you can ditch them two long poles. We won't be needing them. <laughs> well, I think yeah. we can get started now. All right, everybody, start your engines. And now, listeners, everything's in readiness for the start. All the cars are revving up, each waiting for his signal to go. Any minute now. Yes, the first one's off. The Monte Carlo rally's underway. Tony, won't it start? <laughs> won't it start? <laughs> won't it start? Of course it won't start, idiot. Women, won't it start? <laughs> You'll be asking me if I've switched on next. Well, have you? <laughs> she's right, she's dead right. <laughs> Mind your own business. I found the trouble. What was it? I hadn't switched on. <laughs> oh, come on, let me have a go. That's it. Listen to her purring away there. Well, what are we waiting for? Is something stopping the front wheels from moving forward? Oh, yes, I see what it is. What? They've put two coats of paint on the starting line. Wait a minute. We're moving. Yes, we're moving. Quick, let the clutch in. time now. Six hours since the rally started. Getting dark. Where are we? I'm not sure, Bill. Have a look at that sign. Okay, I... Oh. What does it say? Sucky Hall Street. <laughs> we'll have to do better than this, Hancock. Don't worry, I'll get this car to Dover tonight if it kills me. Tickets, please. Four singles to Dover, please. <laughs> You'll find a car in the guards' van. <laughs> uh, 
This is Brown Johnson reporting once again on the progress made so far in the Monte Carlo rally. Now, we've just heard that the first driver to reach Dover was Captain Anthony Wheels Hancock in his 1896 modified AJY special. Please silence, please worship the more. Well, congratulations, Captain Hancock, on breaking a record for the Glasgow to Dover run. What a fantastic speed you must have kept up. Ah, well, it's downhill all the way, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> downhill? It's not, you know. Well, it is for us. We've got big back wheels. <laughs> Come on, Tub, we'd better get some sleep. The ferry leaves for Boulogne first thing in the morning. Good morning, everybody. Brown Johnson reporting on the second day of the Monte Carlo rally. Uh, as listeners, I think, already know, the BBC's motor racing correspondent, Raymond Baxter, is actually taking part in the rally and is recording up-to-the-minute eyewitness accounts from inside his car. And so, for the first of these reports, over to Raymond Baxter. Raymond Baxter reporting from Boulogne, ready to begin stage two of the Monte Carlo rally. Now, the cars are pouring off the ferry onto French soil. And there goes Captain Hancock's AJY special looking somehow different with her twin funnels, her streamlined mainmast and underslung lightweights. A really magnificent sight as she slowly drives into the custom shed for examination. Now, Tony, are you sure you can handle the French customs? What? A lad? I'll have you know that je parle français aussi bon que anyone else. <laughs> well, you know what the French are and you know what customs officials are. Moment, vous just pipe down, peu, and leave it to the connoisseurs. <laughs> ah, bonjour, monsieur le douanier. Bonjour, monsieur. Avez-vous quelque chose à déclarer? Mais non, je suis, je suis simplement un chauffeur dans le Monte Carlo. Uh, très bien, monsieur. Mais je dois vous avertir que si vous avez avec vous des narcotiques, des bijoux, du tobac, des animaux, des armes à feu, ou vous comprenez des choses semblables, vous pouvez les déclarer. Écoutez, je vous ai assuré, et je vous en prie de me croire. C'est la vérité. Je n'ai absolument rien à cacher. What did he say? Never mind about him. What did I say? <laughs> Tony, that's no way to get through. Let me try their French customs. Bonjour, mon capitaine. <laughs> Oh, we all know what that means. <laughs> oh, quel charme, quelle beauté, quelle élégance, quelle femme. T'as un téléphone? Mais oui, Shepard's Bush, 74665. <laughs> hello, hello. Au revoir, chérie. What did all that mean? Well, roughly translated, it means we go straight through. Come on. <laughs> Amour, 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 amour. You're not having any more, mate. <laughs> An old favourite but came in useful there. That's your lots. Come, children, on our way to Monte Carlo. came on the rally for anyway. <laughs> Good evening, listeners. Brown Johnston again. And here is the latest news of the Monte Carlo rally. The halfway stage has been reached, and I'm very pleased to say that so far the British contingent has kept fairly well together. But the most amazing thing is that leading the field is none other than Wheels Hancock. Yes, 
That 59-year-old car of his is holding its own against the high-powered, up-to-date sports models from all over the world. They just can't seem to pass him. I'd give anything to know just how he's managing to do it. All right, Sid, we've crossed the bridge. Right, blow it up. <laughs> right, and when we get round the corner, we'll start another landslide. Who's driving that car directly behind us? Let's see, number 24, Armstrong Sidley, driven by Air Vice Marshal Pathfinder Bennett. Right, turn the signpost round. That's one path he won't find. <laughs> here he comes, here he is. Well, he's going at a fast lick, isn't he? Still, I think he'll like turkey when he gets there. <laughs> hey, fella, something's gone wrong. There's a car behind us. Got past all the traps we laid. He must have taken a shortcut. Who is he, Moira? Just a minute. 76. <gasps> Good heavens, it's the car that the BBC commentator's in. Raymond Baxter. Baxter, we'll have him. Yes. Quick, sit! Smoke bombs! <laughs> Good evening. Raymond Baxter again, this time speaking to you from the road about 90 miles southeast of Paris, heading towards the mountainous stage of the Rhine. Now, I understand that we're now lying second on the road to Wheels Hancock, whose car I can see not half a mile ahead of me. We seem to be catching up on him pretty quickly, but now, what, just a minute now, wait a minute here. This is positively uncanny. A, a clear blue sky and a nice bright sun one minute, and now suddenly a thick fog has just sprung up. I can't see more than two feet in front of the car. And we've got to be very careful here. Now, now, according to my road map, we should be approaching a narrow bridge spanning a deep mountain stream. Out of the car, I can't see a thing, but we must be somewhere near it. Now, perhaps if I were to lean my head out of the window and... Put the bridge back, Sid. <laughs> Good evening, listeners. Brown Johnston again. And we're now at the last stages of the Monte Carlo rally. Well, we shan't be able to give you any more eyewitness accounts because, unfortunately, we seem to have lost proper contact with Raymond Baxter. His last recording, picked up by the BBC, didn't give much information. He said simply... Uh, 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 shoo! Thank you, Raymond Baxter. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, as the rally nears its completion, we've just been informed by the Air Ministry of a sudden change in weather conditions over the latter stages of the route. There's a fierce blizzard blowing in the Alp Maritime, the mountains just north of Monte Carlo, through which the leaders should now be passing. It's no good. We can't go on. We'll have to stop. We can't stop now. Another two hours, we'll be in Monte Carlo. There's one million two hundred thousand francs at stake. You keep driving. But I can't see all this snow. You've got windscreen wipers, haven't you? They're not much good when you haven't got a windscreen. <laughs> ah, well, be fair. You know, when I get chilly, I'm liable to have one of my turns. Hey, just look at this weather. It's getting worse. The snow must be a foot deep. Oh, much more than that. I'm talking about inside the car. <laughs> I told you we should have got one with a roof on it. Look at us. A bowler out in the pipe each and the kids will start slinging snowballs at us. You keep your eyes on the road, Hancock. The service is like glass. There's a 4,000 drop on one side and smack into the chasm. I wouldn't worry. Even if this car did go over the edge, I bet we'd have to get out halfway and push it. <laughs> I wonder how the other cars are getting on. Well, I think they should all be in the Mediterranean by now. What do you mean? Well, a pot of paint, a few deft strokes with the old brush. It's amazing what you can do with some of them dangerous bend signs. You'd better go carefully along here, Tony. It's getting worse. Yeah, look at those mountains up there. There must be millions of tons of snow in that lot. Yes, I was reading about that the other day. Do you know that a sudden violent noise could bring the lot down on top of us? Really? Yes. Yes, it's the echo. It vibrates round the valley and causes an avalanche. Don't worry, it won't happen here. We'd have to kick up a horrible din to bring that lot down. Ah, oh, well. Let's have the radio on. Yes. This is the BBC Light Programme. Whitey, whitey! <laughs> Well, I 
think it speaks for itself, doesn't it? Well, that's the worst landslide I've ever seen. Lucky that rescue party came along and dug us out. We'd have still been there. Has anybody seen Tony? Yeah, he fell over the edge of the cliff. They're still looking for him. Oh, look, there he is, chatting that man who's trying to get him up. Of course, this isn't the first time I've been hanging from a cliff top by the tips of my fingers. I didn't think it was, no. Well, you could... No, you could tell by the cool, calm, professional way I was screaming my head off before you came along. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I had noticed. Yes, sir. Well, I've been mad all my life, you, you know. Really? Oh, yes, when I was in the army, I was over the hill most of the time. Were you? <laughs> You know, the time I've got in mind was on the on the Everest climb. Have you climbed Everest? Yes, when I was out in India. Oh. Every morning before breakfast. Did you? <laughs> oh, dear, dear. I know what you're going to say now. Yeah. I can tell you the exact words you're going to say. What? Hunt and Hillary. Yeah, they all do. It makes you sick. I was at the top of Everest when they were just a gleam in the father's eye. Really? Are, are you sure? Am I sh Listen, you've heard about them great big footprints they found in the snow up there? Yeah. Mine. 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 Oh. Of course, that's not the story they give out. Oh, dear me, no, they... <laughs> I realise now the biggest mistake I made was not sticking a flag in the top. Oh, you should have done that. I know. Well, I left me lunch up there. Did you? I will. <laughs> that's gone. I went back and had a look. Huh? Well, anyway, do you mind taking your spike boots off my fingers? Oh, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> all right. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. I'm sorry. I just thought I'd mention it in yeah, classic. Yeah. Anyway, the time I'm telling you about was, let me see, it'd be the tenth time I climbed it. That'd be a Thursday. Hmm? It'd be a Thursday, yes, that's yeah. right. <laughs> I said to my mate, Harry, you don't know Harry, do you? No, I never met him. Nice fella he is, yeah. nice fella. Yeah, he took to drink in the end. Oh, dear. It was the making of him. What was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I said to Harry, do you fancy Everest today? He said, well, it'll make a day out, won't it? Yeah. So we packed some sandwiches and off we went. <laughs> well, I got to, oh, I suppose it must have been about 32,000 feet. Ah, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everest isn't as tall as that. Was then. It was then. <laughs> Me and Harry... Me and Harry wore it down, running up and down it. <laughs> well, there I was. Yeah. There I was. Where? To put, put you in the picture. Yeah. There I was. Dangling over a precipice, hanging onto a rope that was tied round Harry, who was standing on the top. When he suddenly yeah. says, Hey, look at the time, he says. It's a quarter to seven. I've got to go home. I said, you... <laughs> I said, you can't go home and leave me dangling over the edge of this cliff. Come and help me up. Well... I don't know whether it was his conscience, but mm -hmm. his whole attitude changed. Did it, yeah. He could see he'd been selfish. You know, he, he blushed with shame. Yeah. Mm. I've never seen a man more ashamed of himself. He, he knelt down on the edge, and yeah. he looked down at me, and he said, Forgive me, old man. I was, I was being selfish. I, I realised you've got to get down as well as me. Do you know what he did? What? He cut the rope. <laughs> Hey, Tub, hurry up. They've dug the car out. Let's get a move on. Oh, come in. Do you know, then, I'll, I'll, I'll see you next week. Well, I, I hope so. I look forward to our little chat. Well, tell you why. It's been delightful. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> You're the only one who understands me. Well, goodbye. Yes, then. goodbye. Tell her. Come, children, to Monte Carlo and the prize money. <laughs> Turn out to welcome us. Where's Mr. Carlo? Who? Monte Carlo, the bloke who owns the place. <laughs> oh, isn't it wonderful? First home in the Monte Carlo rally. Yeah, and here comes the mayor with the prize money. Ah, mes amis, congratulations. What a magnificent achievement. You have won the Monte Carlo rally, and I have great pleasure in presenting you with this check for one million two hundred thousand francs. And here it is. 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 I'm sorry, I, I, I was miles away. I... Well, here it is. Oh, yes, the check for one million two hundred thousand francs. No, a ticket for parking. <laughs> You've been stuck here on the starting line for four days now. Officer, I can explain. The start yes. has gone wrong. I, I'm sorry. It's not I, my fault. I wouldn't bother you again. Have an address. Have an address yeah, yes, with yes, me. Yeah. I mean, it's the pleasure. You, well, we know about that. Come on with your name and address. And you're not you coming to the press. And you're... You 
you have been listening to Raymond Baxter and Brian Johnston's Half Hour. And in the programme, you also heard Tony Hancock with Moira Lister, Bill Kerr, Sidney James and Kenneth Williams. Incidental music was composed by Wally Stott and recorded by the BBC Augmented Review Orchestra, conducted by Harry Rabinowitz. The script was written by Ray Galton and Alan Simpson, and the programme which was recorded was produced by Dennis Main Wilson. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of Hancock's Half Hour, and I didn't confuse you entirely before that started. I confused myself, which is not difficult to do, let's face it. I will be back again tomorrow night, 6 p.m. GMT, same place, same time, with more fabulous stories to help you get through your day, get through your evening, drop off to sleep, whatever it is you do. When you listen to me, I can understand if you drop off to sleep while you're listening to me. Don't forget to check out my podcast page at patreon.com forward slash Foxy After Dark. Can't wait to catch up with you all tomorrow night, same time, same place. Stay safe, always be kind, love you all.